Welcome to the World History One Lecture Series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10-second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in 5 seconds. Welcome to World History One Lecture 9.5 on Mongols in the Late Church and take the horse, they said. It would be faster, they said. Well, not for this guy. But horses were a very important part of early American history. What do I mean? Let's look at the Revolutionary War. Here's Paul Revere on his famous nighttime ride to Lexington and Concord. He's riding to warn the American soldiers that the British are coming. Fast forward to the American Civil War where we find the cavalry. Soldiers on horseback and whichever side has a better cavalry stood a better chance at winning those important battles. Then we move to the American West where we find those iconic cowboys and American Indians. And even after the horse fades from daily life, horse culture still remains in America. For example, we watch the Kentucky Derby from Churchill Downs every year. Others watch My Little Pony, Twilight Sparkle and the gang. And then there are those people who watch football and are fans of the Denver Broncos. So, horse culture is an important part of American society. But what would a society look like if it was based solely on horse culture? And would that culture focus on preserving knowledge as it moved throughout the world? These are the questions we'll answer today. And with that said, let's go to the next slide. We've studied many civilizations in this course, and all of them have had certain characteristics or markers that make them a civilization. Now we have these guys. Mongols are a nomadic, horse-based culture who do not have the traditional markings of a civilization. And the thing that's missing is an urban culture. There is no Rome, Greece, or Jerusalem. Instead, Mongol civilization moves from place to place across the continent, and they move far. Mongols are first found in Inner Asia. That's modern Mongolia, and as you can see, that's north of the Great Wall of China. That wall is not going to stop them. Instead, Mongol armies, known as the Golden Horde, invade China, Russia, Southeast Asia, and the Byzantine Empire to create an empire from 1235 to 1259 CE. In fact, Mongols even invade the Islamic Empire, but they are converted to Islam. Go to the next slide. We already talked about the Mongol invasion of China, that's Genghis and Kublai Khan, but the Mongols also invade Europe, and their invasion has lasting impacts on European history. Eastern European populations decline because of warfare and refugee flight. You either get out of the way of the Golden Horde, or you get hurt. How hurt? The Mongols might have brought the bubonic plague with them as they conquered Eastern Europe and Byzantium. The Mongols don't even need to take over your capital to destroy your civilization. The Golden Horde never invades Constantinople, but the effects of their invasion on Byzantium will lead to weakness and the fall of the empire I will end you. The Mongols invade Byzantium and they make Byzantium so weak that Constantinople finally falls to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 and becomes the capital of the Ottoman Empire from 1301 to 1922 CE. This may not be such a bad thing. The name of the city is changed to Istanbul and the city is sustained by Islamic institutions. So the Hagia Sophia goes from a church to a mosque. 
go to the next slide. So invaders like the Mongols or the Germanic tribes are not interested in preserving knowledge. Instead, they're interested in conquering everybody and killing those people who get in their way. Well, with that happening across Europe, can knowledge be protected? It all depends on where the knowledge is located and who's doing the protecting. Knowledge in Eastern Europe is protected in cities like Constantinople. Here is the Library of Constantinople, and as you can see, they are still doing it today. The Islamic Empire sought to foster knowledge, and they spread it through trade. The Islamic Empire, the Ottomans, don't go into Byzantine and level the place. Instead, they find this information in Constantinople and then they use it to make their civilization better. The same does not happen in Western Europe. The masses in Western Europe were uneducated and concerned with feudal obligations. Keep calm, we don't live, we just survive. Things are so bad that there is a serious possibility that knowledge will not expand and perhaps be lost in medieval Western Europe. Go to the next slide. Luckily for Western Europe, the church steps in to help preserve Western knowledge. The late medieval church preserved and expanded knowledge, and here's how they did it. Religious scholars were literate. They could read and usually worked in protected monasteries. They're working in buildings or compounds where they are not being affected by invasions. These scholars translated Greek and Arabic texts into Latin and made knowledge available in Europe like philosophy, medicine, and science. Gradius ago TV medieval ecclesiasm. Thank you, medieval church, for saving all of this stuff. They didn't just stop there. Church scholars laid the foundations for the first European degree granting university in Bologna in 1088 CE. The first Western university shows up in Italy. Italy is about to become very important. That's it for this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in class.